Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here. And as you've just heard, this, in fact, is the first talk that I've given in my new role as the chief scientific advisor to the HM's government. Um, and in fact, uh, looking at this slide reminds me of two things. So I've been doing the job for a week. Um, it feels like about five years, I think it's fair to say. Um, uh, but one of the things I'm having to get used to is the acronym FEVER that uh, besieges uh, government. Um, and I have to say that medicine actually is pretty bad for acronyms, uh, but government beats it. Um, and, but one acronym that actually doesn't seem too bad is Government Office for Science, Go for Science, doesn't seem to be to be too bad, potentially an acronym. Um, the other thing I need to get used to is actually how you spell the word advisor. Um, and uh, you can spell it both ways, but in fact I think this isn't the way it's uh, going to be spelt by the uh, Government Office for Science, it's advisor, but anyway. Um, so I will give you one slide on the role of the GCSA. Um, and if you think about the things that are really important for government, um, one of them, of course, is our well-being, our security, uh, the environment in which we live, our infrastructure. Um, and the other, of course, is economic growth and prosperity. And so that drives three of the most important things that the Government Office for Science must lead on. And that is that I don't think anyone in this lecture theatre will need persuading of the importance of science, engineering, technology, and social science for good policy. And therefore, part of my job is going to be to bring together the science communities, and I mean I'm inclusive when I use that term now, in industry, academia, and government so that we can make sure that our enormously strong science base in the UK translates into all of the benefits that the economy and society need. So that's the first of these bullet points, which is knowledge translated to economic advantage. Uh, the second follows from government's natural concern for our infrastructure and our security, and that again is that science contributes in every way, really, to the environment in which you live. You only have to look around a, a building like this, and, you know, keeping the electricity on, making sure that people are able to get here. And so it's about infrastructure resilience. It's about making sure that science contributes maximally to make sure that the environment in which we live um, enables us to function as an advanced and secure society. Um, and the third thing is, of course, providing scientific advice in the context of emergencies. And I'll say a little bit more about that with at least one example that I talk about during the, the, the talk. Um, again, I don't think that uh, an audience in the physics department uh, in Oxford uh, needs much persuasion about uh, the importance of evidence, and that's both quantitative evidence using numbers uh, understanding statistics, um, but also using qualitative evidence properly in developing the best policy. So that's the fourth area. Um, and I think that it's clear that science needs advocacy and leadership, and that's an important role for the Government Office for Science. Um, and we are only as good as the advisors with whom we work. And so part of my job is actually to work very widely with the broad science community uh, across government, the chief scientists in each department, but also the scientific community in academia and in industry. So that's the broad scope of my new role. Um, and there's something perhaps rather appropriate about talking in the Lindemann Lecture Theatre um, in Oxford, because of course Lindemann was an extremely important science advisor to government uh, before and during the last war. Um, and, of course, if you read uh, Snow's um, Godkin lectures on science and government, uh, then you might wonder whether a, 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 an alternative lecture theatre, uh, there must be one in Oxford somewhere, might be the Tizard Lecture Theatre, um, because, of course, Tizard was also a very important Oxford figure who was very important in the development of radar uh, before and during the Second World War. Now, this is about open science, and it's probably appropriate to start with a taxonomy of what we mean by openness 
at the start of this meeting. And looking at the program, most of this will be covered at some point during the next uh, 48 hours. But it starts at the left-hand end of this figure with new ways of doing science as well in terms of collecting the data in a more open fashion. And of course, there's no single right answer to the way scientific experiments should be done and the data should be collected. But of course, it is data that underpins the scientific endeavor, and it still varies from the single investigator working alone in a laboratory collecting data all the way through to the more open and innovative ways of collecting data on a, a very large scale. There's then, of course, what do you do with the data once it's been collected? And there will be a lot in this meeting on making the data available much more widely. But I will say something more about that at the moment because there is a sort of generic feeling that there's something magical about data and you just put it all out there and it'll all happen. Um, data, as we will discuss widely, needs metadata. It needs a lot of other context in order to become useful. Um, and of course, data comes from many different environments. So it comes from the research laboratory, uh, so data generated at Oxford, in other universities, in institutes around the UK, around the globe, so the sort of data sets that CERN might generate, for example. Um, but it's worth remembering that the scientific enterprise in the UK and indeed around the world happens in environments outside universities as well. Uh, so, for example, on Monday, I had the privilege of visiting the Met Office, um, and they generate extraordinary data, um, with, which is important to all of us. Um, and so there's the public sector research data, uh, the Met Office data being a good example of that. And then, of course, another important uh, set of data, which has immense value for research, are the administrative data sets, which are held on every one of us. And I'll say a little bit more about that a bit later on. Um, so, and then finally, on the right of this, is what happens to the data, the interpretation, at the point of, of its publication. How is it disseminated in the widest possible fashion? And of course, in order to have the maximum impact, science needs the maximum distribution. And that takes us into open access. But as I will say, of course, open access is a lot more than simply putting the paper, the printed word, and the printed figures out there. It's what the new technology offers in terms of the potential to delve behind the actual written word, where I think we're only at the start of the exploitation of the possibilities. So that's the taxonomy, starting on the left with the inputs, the research process itself, and then the outputs, and most importantly, the impacts of those outputs. Now, on the collecting the data, we are quite clearly seeing major transitions occurring. And all of this, again, is going to be talked about later. Uh, so an obvious example uh, was the Human Genome Project, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, uh, which could only be achieved in the way it was through massive collaboration. Um, but we're seeing now data collected by, if you like, the non-traditional data collectors. So we're seeing collaborations between the professional in inverted commas science community and the amateur community, the people that aren't actually paid for a living to do their science. Um, and an example of that that I'll illustrate in a moment is Ashtag, uh, but you'll be hearing a talk later this morning about Galaxy Zoo, where with the enormous numbers of astronomical objects out there, uh, the public are able to contribute to the annotation of the astronomical world um, in ways that it would be very difficult for the professional community to do on its own. 
And if you like, the benefits of collecting data in this way are obvious. They are about collaboration. They're about bringing together uh, different skill sets, skill sets from people across the world. Um, but of course, it's also about scale. And one of the issues with much science is the problem of the power of the study. And if one's looking for small effects, then statistical robustness requires very large data sets. And that, of course, increasingly can only be accomplished through collaboration. And human genetics is a very good example of that, where if you want to find a genetic variant that contributes only a very small increased relative risk of a particular phenotype of disease, uh, uh, just a, a characteristic, then actually you require thousands or potentially tens of thousands of individuals to actually identify that with statistical robustness. And that can only be done by collaboration. So it is about collaboration, it's about scale, it's about statistical power. And none of these things are simple unalloyed goods. It's about choosing the right method for asking and answering the right question. So the Genome Project, very good example. And I actually started at the Wellcome Trust uh, in 2003, just as the announcement was made of the completion of the sequence. The draft sequence was 2000, the complete sequence was 2003. And what has happened since then has been, I think, absolutely extraordinary in terms of moving to sequence one human genome in about 10 years to now dozens of human genomes in laboratories around the world every single day. Um, and this has all happened because of three things, or four things, sorry. Uh, collaboration, funding partnerships, because this was at a scale that no single funder could fund, uh, but importantly, public-private collaboration. And of course, that's the other potential way of doing science in different ways, which is actually collaborating not only between scientists in different environments, but people working in different economic models as well. So people that are publicly funded on the one hand and privately funded on the other. Uh, but the absolutely crucial principle of genome science, where I think it's led the way certainly in the biological sciences, although I think the physical sciences had got there first in some areas at any rate, uh, was that it was done in an open fashion. Now, this approach is being translated to other areas, and here is an initiative that has been formulated in the United States, but it will be a global partnership. Um, I'm always very slightly suspicious when the word, you know, analogous to the Genome Project is applied in other areas, because this is not, in a sense, really a genome in, uh, initiative. Um, but it, it, it's about actually collaborating and analyzing and developing new materials at a scale and in an open fashion that wasn't possible before. Um, and this is just getting off the ground. It was announced uh, uh, months ago. Um, it's uh, got a substantial amount of funding behind it. And one of the big challenges is to speed the development time for getting things from the laboratory, from the materials laboratory here, into production. And of course, it's very important. It's a bit like drugs. You can't just put a new material into an aircraft engine and assume it's going to be okay, because uh, a lot of materials are in critical pieces of infrastructure for human safety. And so there is a very rigorous process that needs that new materials need to go through. But as for the pharmaceutical industry, people are worried that the length of time it's taking to get new materials into application is too long. And so this is an example of another open collaborative initiative to develop new materials. Um, now, I talked about what's sometimes labeled as citizen science, and there will be more discussion about that. And of course, we're all citizens. Uh, finding the right terminology for this, I think, is quite difficult. Um, but here is an example where the collection of data by anyone who wants to is proving hugely valuable. Um, and so on the right, oh, sorry, on the left, you see the spread of um, uh, Calara fraxinea, which is the fungus that's causing ash dieback across Europe. And on the right, uh, you can see uh, the ash tag application. It's available to anyone in the room on the app stores. 
Um, and you can see now the collection of uh, data and how rapidly, in fact, and how broadly uh, Kalara is distributed across the United Kingdom. And this is a perfect example of how one can collect data at a rate and in a form, taking advantage of the fact that everyone is carrying a GPS tracker with them. And so you can enter it and you know exactly where the photo was taken because it's been uh, GPS marked. Uh, so this is a very powerful example of how important contributions to knowledge, important for public policy, important for understanding the spread of disease and potentially how one might think about controlling it. Um, this is the sort of thing that I think we're only seeing the start of. Um, and of course, we're also seeing uh, the, 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 the opportunity to use completely novel sources of information. So for example, uh, Google is able to track an outbreak of flu or indeed dengue uh, much faster now than public health physicians are able to do it, but just by looking at the searches that people make. Um, and collaboration is happening in other ways too, and so this I think will be a very well-known example to the people in this room of a piece of massively collaborative mathematics. So this was communication, uh, collaboration amongst the professional community, um, and it was Tim Gowers that initiated this, um, and um, they came up with um, in a very short time, um, a new combinatorial proof to the density version of the hales jewett theorem. Um, um, just ask me about it afterwards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but not too carefully. <laughs> um, but this was a, an example of a challenge that was made to the community and was solved um, in a very short time in a way that just wouldn't have happened before. But I want to come back to a remark that I made at the beginning which is that people mix up data with information and knowledge. So data per se, without a lot of other information, may be of very little value. And in order to be of value, and I had the privilege of serving on the, the working party of the Royal Society that Geoffrey Bolton led science as an open enterprise, data has got to be intelligible for the user, it's got to be accessible, it's got to be accessible, and it's got to be usable. And actually, it takes a lot of work and sometimes quite a bit of money to take raw data and turn it into a form that is intelligible, accessible, accessible, and usable. So the challenge is, and it's really important, I think, that we distinguish between data, which is the raw material, information, which is data which has all the associated metadata, from the accumulation of that information into knowledge. And of course, what then really matters is it's one thing having knowledge, it's another thing applying it. And so if we're talking about open data, we need to think and open science about that whole chain from starting with the, the raw data and ending up with the societal benefit. And the illustration on the right of this slide is um, an example, and I'll show you the application of that in a minute, of a very nasty, uh, potentially nasty, uh, cancerous tumor, malignant melanoma, which when it develops secondaries has historically been very, very difficult to treat, to the discovery on the top of a sequence abnormality associated with the development of melanoma, and indeed on the bottom, the whole cancer genome, uh, work from Mike Stratton and his colleagues, to the application of the discovery that malignant melanomas have a commonly a mutation in a, uh, a protein in a growth pathway called BRAF, to a, an inhibitor of activated BRAF, uh, vemurafenib, and here are um, PET scans, positron emission tomography scans of two patients treated with a BRAF inhibitor before and after treatment. And basically the, the, the very bright um, uh, liver and uh, secondaries in the lungs that you can see in the patient on the left and the widespread bony secondaries in the patient on the right, you can see that they have disappeared shortly after treatment. So it's about going from the discovery that there's a mutation in this case, all the way through to a, uh, a treatment. Um, so it's important that data is turned into information, and that's what the scientists must do. We have to work in aggregate to work that uh, 
uh, turn that information into knowledge. And it may be different people that actually end up applying it for the benefit of society. Uh, the other thing to say is that you know, openness itself is not uh, simply an alloy um, uh, good. And what one needs is intelligent openness. And there are some dilemmas, and I'll illustrate those in the next uh, few minutes. Um, so uh, commerce, we need to think about quite carefully. Privately collected data, there isn't necessarily an obligation if, if uh, shareholders or a private individual pays for the collection of data um, for private benefit, then we can't assume an automatic right uh, to have that information. Um, and in fact, the intellectual property system, the system of patenting, is, was designed originally on the basis that by actually protecting intellectual property, it made it possible for people to be open because they could be open on data that was then protected. But that, of course, then depends on the respect for intellectual property. Um, of course, in the area of health, personal information, there are challenges to each of us in relationship to privacy. And clearly, there are examples where information may be important in terms of our security. And I'll give you some examples. And there are some quite difficult issues. Um, and um, openness of the crocodile's mouth is all right to this bird, which is cleaning its teeth, uh, but may not be all right to many other things that get between those jaws. So I talked a little bit about privately collected data. And often that can and indeed should be open. And the Structural Genomics Consortium is an extremely good example and it's a, an example which is well known in Oxford because uh, it's a, an international collaboration, but there's an important Oxford base here. Um, and that was a public-private partnership between a number of pharma companies and academia here and in Canada um, and in uh, Sweden as well um, to determine the crystallographic structures of proteins on a rather large scale. So many, many protein structures. And you might say, well, why would pharma companies pour money into this? And the deal was that by being a subscriber to this, by, by being a funding partner, the drug companies could choose targets. But what they couldn't do is get any advantage in terms of the knowledge when the sequence was made available. So at the moment the sequence was made available, it was made available to the whole world simultaneously. But the real intellectual property of the pharma industry is, of course, the chemical structure of the drugs. And so for industry, the benefits of having this high throughput crystallographic, and it's developed in many ways, and I think Charles Buntra is talking about it a bit more in this meeting, that's been an example of an extremely good public-private partnership where funds have combined from a number of different public funders, a number of diff different private funders, and uh, led to extremely important new knowledge. Um, much privately generated data will inevitably remain in the private sector, but there are some circumstances in which I think it's reasonable to expect that privately collected data is made publicly available, and I think that's particularly in the context of where there are issues of public safety. So, for example, there's been a lot of discussion about openness in clinical trials, um, and uh, Andrew Whitty from GSK has talked about this and made commitments for GSK about making data from clinical trials leading to drug registrations open. And clearly, if one's dealing with issues of public safety, you know, engineering standards around um, aircraft safety, for example, there comes a point at which it's important that data are potentially made available. So I think that there are, but there are some difficult challenges here, and we don't have an automatic right to data which is generated in the private sector. Uh, there are also issues of the dual use for science. And in some cases, they propose opportunities, and in other cases, there are challenges. Um, and one of the challenges, actually, is that dual use has quite a complicated taxonomy and is used in different situations. And here I've set out three different ways in which the terminology dual use is, is used. Um, one is uh, 
the science done in either the civilian or the military sector, which has uses in the other. Um, and one good example of that is actually shown on the bottom, which is that the development of microwave radar um, is now in most of our kitchens. Um, another context of dual use is the idea of science, which is then subverted to do harm. And that's an important issue, and I'll just give you a vignette around that in a moment. Um, and then, of course, there's the common situation of um, uh, science and engineering, which is developed in one civilian domain and then is used in others. And these would all perfectly legitimately described by dual use, but unless you agree in advance uh, what the terminology is, there might be some confusion. So I think these are all dual use of science. Um, so let's pick up one example which has caused quite a lot of controversy over the last few years, and that is the sequencing and how open the sequence should be of organisms that have the power to be extremely dangerous. Um, and so with the power of um, the archaeology of DNA, it has become possible to sequence microorganisms that have um, uh, died with the people that they killed quite often for many, many years, and in some cases centuries, in the case of the plague uh, bacteria and the Black Death. Um, and indeed, there was quite a lot of controversy as to whether the Black Death was caused by uh, the plague organism Yersinia pestis. But sequencing has now shown unequivocally that it was uh, the same organism. Um, and of course, 1918 influenza, the Spanish flu uh, pandemic, which killed more people than were killed in the Great War, um, that has been resurrected. And there was quite a lot of controversy as to the sequencing of that and how it should be done and whether the results should be made openly available. Um, and then recently, an important scientific question is what are the changes that an influenza virus needs to make in order to switch host from birds or pigs to humans? And that's become a tractable experimental question. And so um, a number of teams in the recent years have been working on the genetic modification of avian H5N1 influenza to understand what determines its transmissibility. And there was a very significant furore last year um, when these papers came for publication as to whether they should be published or whether the information within them should be restricted. Um, and there isn't actually, I think, a completely simple answer to this question, and one needs to look on a case-by-case -case basis. And let me put to you an extreme example, which is that you find that you know two chemicals that you can buy very readily um, in um, a, a chemist shop, when mixed together, form some kind of deadly poison would you immediately publish the recipe um, in a journal? And so I think it's quite easy to see circumstances in which a piece of science leads to obvious potential for misuse that means one needs to think very carefully about whether to publish it. And I think once you accept that principle, then I think you accept the fact that you just have to think carefully about each case as it arises. And indeed, there was very careful thought. There was a lot of debate on both sides of the Atlantic around the world about whether these particular papers should be published or not. And rightly, it was decided that they should be published. But what I would also say, it is right also that one has to think very carefully about the publication of science, which has the potential to be easily misused to cause harm. I'm sure that's something we can discuss. Um, but what I would submit is that the default on the presentation of data, particularly data collected by public funding, is that it should be openness. And let me just illustrate where it has worked, where it hasn't worked, and where there are, I think, some genuine problems. Uh, so where it worked rather well was the infection caused by um, bean sprouts um, in Germany uh, fairly recently where a very uh, toxigenic outbreak of E. coli caused severe disease with renal complications 
uh, and spread through several countries, affecting 4,000 people. And that was an example where the community collaborated. The organism was sequenced at incredible speed. The sequence was made available. Uh, it was eventually uh, tracked down in terms of the uh, origin of the infection. Uh, but this happened in weeks and a small number of months in a way that could never have happened years ago. So this was open science working pretty well. Um, but none of it is, of course, a panacea in the world of epidemiology for very careful contact tracing. This is meticulous work. It, you can't just simply assume, okay, just put the sequences out, it will all sort itself out. There is a lot of epidemiological legwork to sort out this type of outbreak. Um, and this is an example where it didn't work terribly well, um, which is that um, if the temperature um, figures had been made uh, much more available at an open stage, then I think we wouldn't have had the same problems over what's come to be known as climate gate. Um, and I think one of the challenges here was that people were sharing uh, meteorological data sets on the basis that they were private or confidential data sets. And I think if you look at that in retrospect, uh, that was a mistake. It's not really acceptable, the idea that um, uh, data as really, in a sense, should be publicly available as temperatures were being circulated in that fashion. Um, and I think a lot has been learned from this. Um, but I mean, again, actually, temperature data is a very, another very good example of where data without metadata aren't very useful. So for example, uh, atmospheric pressure measurements are of no value at all unless you know the altitude at which they're connected. Um, similarly, temperature information is of no value unless you know the precise place at which it's corrected, and unless you have some assurance that a temperature measured in 1890 is comparable with a temperature measured in 1980. And so these are examples where raw data without the metadata don't have value. But I think that everyone accepts that if we're going to have the maximum confidence in data about climate and weather, then that information needs to be open. And here's an example which I think at face value looks very straightforward, but isn't actually. And it's back to our friend influenza. And at the time when, and of course the whole world knew that the next pandemic of influenza was going to be H5N1 and that it was going to come out of Southeast Asia, and of course it didn't. It came out of the Americas and it was a, a swine flu. So um, this is still very difficult stuff. But um, H5N1 influenza remains a major threat. And of course there's a new uh, avian influenza uh, strain in China at the moment, which is actually being uh, talked about very openly. Um, but when H5N1 influenza was starting to infect significant numbers of people, though fortunately there was not significant human-to-human -human transmission, there was a debate as to whether the flu sequences would be made available or not. And some countries in Southeast Asia said, we're not making these sequences available. Um, and there was a huge row. And eventually, uh, through work of WHO and others, it was agreed that sequences would be made available. But the sort of underlying argument was that we will let you have our flu viruses, you will determine the sequences, you will get all the credit for the science, and what's more, you will make the vaccines which we will not get, you will develop the drugs which we may not be able to afford. And whilst it doesn't make sense for something which is potentially a great danger to society. So we have the whole genome science which has been done in the open domain, and the second something comes along which may kill a lot of people is not done in the open domain. That isn't logical. Nevertheless, I think we do have to understand the arguments about essentially equity, which is we'll give you the sequences, but we won't benefit. So I think there are some genuine dilemmas and challenges about open data in that context. Um, and I'm not gonna say a lot about open access. I have said a lot about open access over the years, and I can't resist putting in the logo of eLife. Um, uh, uh, but research, of course, is not finished until it's published. And 
you can only maximize the impact of the research if you maximize its distribution. The publication of research is a research expense. So in the same way that you expect, in, as part of your research, to pay for the gels, to pay for the centrifuge, to pay for the uh, salary of the postdoc, um, then paying for the cost of the publication is a part of the research cost. Um, but of course, what has happened is that the IT revolution enables a revolution in the ways in which we can disseminate the findings of research. But what I would say is, and I think there will be more on this during this meeting, that open access is much more than simply taking a paper, um, making a PDF file of it, and making it available to everyone. It's actually, and I think that we are only at the tip of the iceberg in exploiting the real opportunities of ICT in disseminating the results of our research. So, of course, it's about mining the text, and that's something that's absolutely crucial so that we can get information by combining information from within papers. It's about how we display very complicated data sets. Um, it's about the opportunity for community annotation and feedback, so the working community working with papers, publications in ways they couldn't before. And I just think this is an area where human imagination coupled with the technology is going to mean the way that people look at the results of science in five years and ten years will be in ways that I think few of us can imagine now. So it's a very exciting time. Now this is, of course, is about openness and rigor. And uh, the two are not necessarily correlated. In other words, it was possible to do extremely rigorous science uh, before the ICT revolution. Um, and equally, uh, it, was, it was possible to do extremely sloppy science. And I'm afraid it remains just as true um, in a post-ICT era as it ever was. Um, and so, uh, but I, I would submit that openness offers new tools for rigor that weren't available before. Um, and people, I think, often confuse honest error with fraud. So a lot of science which comes out of laboratories ultimately turns out not to be precisely the way it turns out to be at the end. And that's because science proceeds through experimentation, it's about uncertainty, and the purpose of experimentation is to reduce that uncertainty. Um, one, we realize, I think, when you're looking at small effects that you need very large data sets. And this is where openness and collaboration are going to improve the rigor of science because increasingly people will not be able or allowed or funded, importantly, to do experiments at a suboptimal critical mass. And the genetics community really learned this when suddenly they went from being able to study 100 patients with disease X to 10,000. And that gives you a rigor that was just not possible when you were looking at 100, where you're going to get uh, false positive and indeed false negative results. Um, but the scientific method, of course, is also about reproducibility, it's about scrutiny, and all of that is potentially enhanced by openness. And so I don't think that there's any doubt in terms of improving the potential rigor of science that openness offers us tools that weren't there before. But is it a panacea? No. It's got to be used as another tool like everything else. So although I think that there's a link between the two, I think it's that openness can facilitate rigor, but there isn't a sort of magic bullet there. Um, here's an example of honest error that was sorted out very rapidly in the context of very open publication, uh, which was the uh, so-called FTL, faster than light neutrinos, uh, which turned out, of course, not to be uh, faster than light neutrinos, I think to the relief of a large fraction of the physics community, uh, but probably to the disappointment of some. Um, and of course, the physics community has used um, um, open source um, archives such as archive.org um, for a very long time and frequently exposes potential publications to a community peer review before the definitive publication. Um, 
I would submit that that works well in the physical sciences um, where the volume is somewhat smaller than the volume of research in the biological sciences, where that might be quite challenging. Um, I'll finish on the societal benefit end, which is it's the interface really between research, knowledge, and um, societal benefit, which is that the, the right open data actually enables measurement of service delivery. It provides a quality of accountability that couldn't be there before. It helps in execution, um, and it enables innovation in service delivery in ways that were unimaginable before. And I'll pick health as my example. Um, and these are slides from Andrew Morris in Scotland. And one of the issues is that, of course, the Scottish population at 5 million is a tractable population for doing very large ICT. It's much easier than, than, than 60 million. Um, but they know in real time how many patients there are with diabetes, um, whether it's 251,132 or three, I'm not quite sure, but uh, they know pretty accurately. Uh, they know what fraction of those patients have type 1 diabetes, uh, juvenile onset. They're on a single register. It's integrated between primary and secondary care, and this is updated in real time. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that you can start getting an accountability for delivery of service that just wasn't there before. So this is a graph from 2002 to 2007 of measurements, clinical measurements in diabetics that any medical student would fail their finals if they didn't know you should measure a blood pressure in a patient with diabetes. Uh, but nevertheless, um, in 2003, which was the dip in this graph, only about 50% of patients with diabetes had a recorded blood pressure measurement in, uh, in Scotland. And you can see how there has been a dramatic improvement in the measurement of these important parameters of the potential complications of diabetes, and that is driven by data. And I think there's been a lot of controversy over data, particularly in relation to privacy, but the real importance of health data and having access to it is that it improves clinical care. That's what it's all about. Um, but it's one thing to measure something, and it's this point between knowledge and actually applying it for benefit. What these graphs show is the fall in amputation rates due to peripheral limb blood vessel disease in patients with diabetes and a reduction in the use of laser therapy to treat the blood vessel proliferation of small blood vessels that occurs in the retina of patients with diabetes. And there have been very significant 30 or 40 percent falls in amputation rates and the use of laser surgery in patients with diabetes in Scotland. So that is the challenge for all of us who apply knowledge for human benefit, which is it's one thing to discover the knowledge, it's another thing to apply it, and open data can let you do this. Uh, but I don't want to go away without making it absolutely clear that I think for each of us in this room, we know how precious and important our personal information is to each of us. And therefore, it's extremely important that those, the data about us are treated with the greatest respect, that information, when used in aggregate, is used on the basis of, at the very least, effectively pseudonymized data. So it may be key linked so that it can be updated in real time, uh, but it is effectively anonymized. And so one needs a framework to do that. And I just want to say a little bit about the Administrative Data Task Force because uh, that's been chaired by Sir Alan Langlands, and that's been looking at the challenges of bringing together administrative data sets across government for the purposes of research to enable better policy. Um, and it's made a series of recommendations, one of which is that there should be an administrative data research centre in each of the four countries in the UK. And the issue about handling sensitive personal data is that it needs to be done in an environment which is sometimes called a safe haven. And that is an environment in which there are rules for access and indeed very severe penalties for anyone who attempts to breach the privacy and confidentiality of any of the individuals whose data is held in the center.
And so it requires legislation to facilitate research access to administrative data and to allow data linkage between departments. Uh, we need to have research accreditation, um, and it will, of course, need funding. So this is in the works at the moment, and government will respond in due course. Um, so I think I've spoken for long enough, and this is the summary slide which you can read, um, but I want to read a quote from that great uh, evolutionary and enlightened scholar E.O. Wilson, who wrote, Thanks to science and technology, access to factual knowledge of all kinds is rising exponentially while dropping in unit cost. It's destined to become global and democratic. Soon it will be available everywhere on television and computer screens. What then? The answer is clear, synthesis. We are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. The world henceforth will be run by synthesizers, people able to put together the right information at the right time, think critically about it, and make important choices wisely. So this meeting should not just be about data. It's about turning data into wisdom. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>